the good news is there's not a test at the end. Um, I'm Stuart Schwartz. I'm the uh, policy committee chair for the Partnership for Smarter Growth, one of your hosts uh, tonight. Your other hosts are RVA Rapid Transit and GRTC, the Greater Richmond Transit Company. Uh, we are thrilled by the turnout. We had over 200 RSVPs. Uh, some are still trickling in, as you can see, and they bumped us to the bigger room. Uh, and we owe a, a great uh, bit of thanks to uh, Rich Conti, uh, who heads the Science Museum, for donating the space today. Uh, we think they had a little self-interest because the, the new BRT system will be stopping right outside their front door. Uh, you know, we're, we, we didn't plan it this way. We started planning months ago to invite Joe Calabrese down from Cleveland. Uh, he heads Cleveland's transit company and spearheaded the uh, bus rapid transit system called the Health Line in Cleveland, uh, one of the most successful, if not the most successful, new bus rapid transit system uh, in the country. And we're going to celebrate its success and learn from it tonight. So we're really appreciative of him coming tonight. Uh, Andrew Moore, PSG's president, will introduce him in just a minute. We'll introduce Joe in just a minute. Uh, in the meantime, our partners gonna, are going to give a couple of quick presentations. Uh, we're going to start with David Green, the, the head of our transit company of GRTC, who is going to give you an update on our bus rapid transit system. And can I now have a hand of cel in clapping and celebration for the grant we just won? Thank you, David. There are a lot of folks to thank in that, including the Department of Rail and Public Transit, uh, the governor, uh, the mayor and his staff, and certainly GRTC, uh, and all the folks who've done all the hard work and planning for this for so long. So David's going to give you an update on, uh, on our project here in town, and then Andrew Terry and Ebony Walden from RVA, RVA Rapid Transit will share the exciting vision that they've been promoting for a network of bus rapid transit connecting the city and the suburbs. And uh, we will be at the table throughout in terms of the work that we're all going to do to invest in transit, the Partnership for Smarter Growth, which, is, uh, which as its name implies, supports the revitalization of our city and our inner suburbs, a great regional transit system connecting it all, walkable and bikeable neighborhoods. And we think this is just the beginning for Richmond. There are many cities investing in uh, significant networks of transit and really in, in undergoing great revitalization. We are joining them. We've been revitalizing. Uh, we're on the move. And we think we can do uh, so much more. And we'll launch it all tonight. So with that, I'm going to introduce uh, David Green from, from GRTC to update you on where we are with our project. Thank you. Thanks, Stuart. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. Let's see if I can get this. All right, so uh, good evening. Look at this room. Um, apparently, this is what everybody does when they can't get Foo Fighters tickets on a Wednesday night. <laughs> you do know they're not playing here, right? They're down the street at the National. Um, just checking, wanted to make sure everybody's actually here to see Joe. So, uh, welcome to the Dome. I want to thank Rich Conti and my friends from the Science Museum for hosting us here tonight. Uh, obviously, we're here to talk about rapid transit for Richmond's future, but I can't think of a better place to do it than some place that was so significant to Richmond's transportation past. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, I encourage you to come back and visit the museum to find out more about this amazing facility. So, GRTC and the Department of Rail and Public Transportation, which we refer to as DRPT, the City of Richmond, Henrico County, and a multitude of other agencies and organizations have been working together for the past five years on a Broad Street Rapid Transit project, something that's evolved into Bus Rapid Transit, or BRT. And before we have Joe speak to you tonight about the good things that they've done in Cleveland, we thought it'd be beneficial to give you an update on our project and tell you a little bit about where we are and where we're going. Oh. <laughs> this is a diagram of the quarter, which uh, involves BRT service running along Broad Street from Willow Lawn to downtown and then following 14th Street south to Main Street and running along Main Street out to Rockets Landing in the East End. The BRT service will use dedicated lanes in various segments of the corridor and will stop at 14 stations. 
The quarter, as you can see, is broken down into four segments, with the largest concentration of, of stations being in the downtown area, as you can imagine. And this is the same diagram that we've been sharing for the past six or eight months. So if you think you've seen this before or seen something that looks similar to this, this is the exact same diagram. This has not changed at all. Shut up. BRT will have many benefits. Uh, it operates faster than regular bus service, and as a result, will increase travel speed and reduce travel times. People who switch from driving their cars to riding BRT will save money. Uh, improvements to station areas and the dedicated uh, bus lanes will calm traffic and reduce traffic congestion, leading to reduction in accidents so it's safer. And the design and construction process will support a bunch of jobs. But uh, perhaps the greatest benefits are the opportunities for economic development, which you'll hear Joe talk about. Development, which will increase property values and subsequently generate tax revenues to the localities. Ultimately, an entire BRT system will provide even greater benefits, but this is the first step for making uh, for a more active and vibrant region. The bigger picture, BRT will help address Central Virginia's poverty problem by providing better access to jobs, education, and medical facilities. So the next question then well, is... Well, when developers come with us and they're riding on that health line, <laughs> the first thing they say is, wow, ride on that health Thank you. The next question, <laughs> aside from how that just popped up, the next question is, is when is all of this going to happen? And um, the answer is, it starts with preliminary engineering and design. And for GRTC, that actually began back in May when we issued a request for proposals. We just received authorization yesterday at our board meeting to award a contract for those services, and we met with the design team yesterday afternoon to begin discussing that phase of the project, which should be completed within about a year, uh, at which time we will then move into final design and construction with an anticipated opening date of 2018, if not sooner. Uh, the biggest challenge that we've been facing uh, is basically how do we pay for all that? And I'm sure you've all heard the exciting announcement last week about the Tiger Grant that GRTC was awarded for this project. Uh, and I know that I'm limited on time, but I want to take a minute just to talk about that because I don't want the significance of this grant award to be lost in the sauce. Tiger is an acronym which stands for Transportation Investment Generating Economic Recovery, and it's a very unique grant program administered directly by the U.S. Department of Transportation for road, rail, transit, and port projects. It goes well beyond transit. And it's, it's a very different grant program than those that we typically receive funding from through the Federal Transit Administration. The Tiger program began after the recession. The first round of awards were made back in 2009 for the intent of, of of uh, generating economic recovery. And there is no guarantee that this program is going to continue into the future. So when the announcement came out last spring, for the sixth round of Tiger applications, uh, it was, uh, we were ecstatic. That's an understatement. We were absolutely thrilled to be in a position uh, because uh, our plan had just been finished. The study was completed. Our project was to the point um, and perfectly positioned to put into an application to submit for such a grant. It's a very competitive grant program, and to give you an idea of what I'm talking about, there were 797 applications submitted for TIGER grants, which is a 36% increase from the 585 that the Department of Transportation received a year ago. The total dollar value of the projects that were applied for was $9.5 billion, an amount 15 times greater than the $600 million that they had actually set aside for the program. 72 awards were made, which is a selection rate of just 9%. Of the 72 awards, 17 were for transit, the largest being for GRTC's project. Of the 21 projects that received funding in the South region, the largest was for our project here in Richmond. And of the 72, GRTC's award was one of the largest in the entire United States, being one of only three that came in at a level of roughly $25 million. 
And of those three, ours was the only one that was fully funded to cover the full 50% of the project cost. So th this is a huge accomplishment and something that all of us should be proud of. The application project for this, this TIGER grant uh, was truly a collaborative effort between GRTC, Department of Transport, uh, Rail and Public Transportation, and Amy Inman and her staff, City of Richmond, Henrico County. Uh, it, it was an extension of how the entire plan has evolved and how the project will continue to develop. And, and if you talk about regional uh, collaboration, this is a textbook example of what can happen when the jurisdictions and various agencies and organizations come together for a meaningful common cause. So it's an incredible win for GRTC and our re region, and it gives us something all to celebrate. to the next slide, but <laughs> thank you. So uh, staying informed, we've got four options because we, we've gotten a lot of feedback from the community and uh, we wanted to do whatever we could to make sure everybody who is interested in this project stays informed. Number one is we, we totally revamped our website and the information that we previously had out there kind of buried related to the BRT study is now uh, directly accessible from our homepage, so you can find out more information there. You can also register your email address with us, and we've got people here to help you do that before you leave. Um, and we'll be pushing information out over the next couple of years as developments occur. We also have an email address that you can contact us from, brt at rodgrtc.com. Uh, you can contact us there and we will answer any specific questions that you might have. And you can also receive information if, for those on Twitter uh, by various um, communications that we'll be pushing out through that method as well. So thank you all for your interest and for being here. And I'm going to turn it over to Andrew Terry now from RVA Rapid Transit. everybody. It's great to see you all here. We're excited uh, at RVA Rapid Transit. I want to tell you a little bit about our organization, but before I do that, I want to acknowledge um, Senator McEachin uh, is here with us. Uh, Don Mark from the mayor's office is here as well. And we have a former Chesterfield supervisor up at the top there who's going to share her wisdom with me at a future date. And Dana Geisler, the president of the Chesterfield Chamber of Commerce, is going to be the moderator uh, for our question and answer session. So thank you all for being here. RVA Rapid Transit launched uh, in March of 2013. Uh, it began with 75 of us, a cross-section of the demographics of metropolitan Richmond, uh, different economic classes, races, uh, backgrounds, county, city. And uh, now we are a citizen-led movement in metropolitan Richmond, and our goal is to bring bus rapid transit to the whole region of metropolitan Richmond. That is Henrico, Chesterfield, Hanover, and the city of Richmond. This is what we're proposing bus rapid transit will look like for our region. We used a study from the, uh, planning, the planning District Commission that came out in 2008. And what the Planning District Commission did was identify the four major corridors of metropolitan Richmond. They're not gonna be a surprise to y'all. Yeah, these are familiar, uh, familiar routes to all of us. And what we did, essentially bus rapid transit, is going to be like our metro system running on the road. Uh, you can see the red line is Midlothian Turnpike running out to the airport. Doesn't that make a lot of sense? Uh, route 1 is the yellow line uh, running north-south. Uh, the green line is in Hull Street. And uh, Hull Street uh, running to Wood Lake, where we have a lot of good energy and support, uh, running up to Mechanicsville, where Ann Snyder, who's sitting here, you may have seen at the paper, her sitting on a rock. She's here tonight, um, and, and she lives up there in Mechanicsville. And uh, the last line, which incorporates our what we're considering the first step uh, that David and Amy at DRPT have got us started with, uh, is Broad Street. So we need to extend that out uh, to Short Pump and Innsbruck, right? Yeah. Right. Yes. I'm going to turn it over now to Ebony Walden. I wanted y'all to see her. Um, Ebony is now on staff with RVA Rapid Transit. And so when you, are, when you sign up for the emails as you leave, you're going to get communication from her. RVA Rapid Transit believes that 
In order to make the vision a reality, you need a good visual, don't you think? And so hopefully you will see this visual everywhere. It's the beginning of our slide. And this is our visual that will hope and uh, brand into your mind and see what RVA Rapid Transit can look like for the first step. So this is what it would look like or could look like on Broad Street. And I just want to point out some of the features that you'll see here. So you'll see the enhanced uh, shelter, which has, which could have you know, off-board fare collection, so it could be fast and efficient. So all you have to do once the bus arrives is get on the bus. And then another feature would obviously be the designated lane, which hopefully we'll have in, in some areas in our BRT system. And the third thing, which is important, is that it's accessible and easy to get on. So most bus rapid transit systems, you know, the um, platform is flush with the doors of the bus, so you can get right on, just like you would a metro or things like that. So hopefully, you'll see this vision, and it'll be in brand, in brand in your hearts and minds, and that will help us make it a reality. Now, I suppose that everybody came here because, for some reason or another, you're very interested in making that vision for uh, rapid transit a reality, both on Broad Street and sort of expand that. So in order to do that, we would love to stay in contact with you all. Andrew mentioned uh, you can sign up for our newsletter out there at the table with the big RVA rapid transit sign, so you absolutely cannot miss it. So if you don't already get our newsletter, please sign up for that. You can obviously go to our website, rvarapidtransit.org. You can like us on Facebook. It would make me very happy if you liked RVA rapid transit on Facebook. That would boost our self-confidence up a little bit. And you can also e email us at rvarapidtransit at gmail.com. Just remember RVA rapid transit, you can, and then you'll be able to find us. But if, you're, if you like to use Twitter, you can follow the discussion by um, using our hashtag, hashtag move RBA, and you can follow the discussion and be a part of it. So without further ado, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Andrew Moore, who's going to introduce our speaker, and give a loud round of applause if you're, you're ready for our speaker to come tonight. Thank you. It's uh, great to see you. I am Andrew Moore, and the president of Partnership for Smarter Growth. And uh, before I introduce our speaker tonight, um, if you enjoy this event, um, Partnership for Smarter Growth has two additional events in this series. This fall, we on October 6th, we have uh, Benjamin Ross, who is a author and speaks on um, suburban sprawl and the ways that we can heal our cities. And then in October 25th, we are going to have a, a bus tour. Uh, looking at the Route 5 corridor going east from the city and uh, looking at the transect from downtown urban development into the rural uh, portions of eastern Morocco. So this should be a, a, a great event and we invite you to come to both of those. A 30 plus year veteran of both the public side and the private side of the public transit industry, our speaker tonight, Joe Calabresi, serves as CEO and general manager of the Greater Cleveland Regional Transit Authority. Prior to accepting his current position in Cleveland in 2000, Joe was the president of the Central New York RTA. With a focus on customer service, image, and strong financial management, RTA has increased its customer base as well as the integral role it plays in moving Northeast Ohio forward. His successes in Cleveland include the agency being named the best large size transit system in North America, and in Joe being named the Outstanding Transit Manager of the Year. Joe is on the Board of Directors of the American Public Transportation Association, is past president of both the New York State and Ohio Public Transit Associations, and represents the transit industry on the USDOT ITS Advisory Committee through an appointment by the U.S. Secretary of Transportation. Locally in Cleveland, Joe is on the boards of the NOACA, Build Up Greater Cleveland, the Downtown Cleveland Alliance, the Senior Transportation Connection, and the City County Workforce Development Board. Joe holds a degree in economics from Syracuse University, an MBA from the University of Buffalo, and completed postgraduate fellowships at Northeastern University, the University of Chicago, and the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania. Please help me welcome Joe Calabresi.
Can you hear me? Yeah. Great. This is a technology that I've never had to use before, but it's really an outstanding uh, facility here. It's my pleasure to be here. Uh, again, I came from Cleveland to share our story with you. Uh, maybe there's some parts of that story that could help as you progress, but as a good friend of mine, Peter Rogoff, the former FDA administrator, often said, if you've seen one transit system, you've seen one transit system. So you can't really <laughs> take everything and make it applicable. But uh, uh, when people ask me why I do this, and I do this often, um, I do this, number one, because our industry is one that shares best practices. And number two, I never come in to do someplace where I don't learn something I can bring back to Cleveland and help out my organization as well. Technology move. Okay, that's us, that's me. Um, I certainly want to congratulate, I, I think, Richmond. Uh, great vision, great support. Uh, the, this session is phenomenal. And certainly I want to congratulate them on the Tiger Grant when I looked last week and saw that I did not get mine. I was pleased to see <laughs> that, that, that David did, did get his. Uh, my pleasure to be here. Uh, Ebony talked about visuals. I'm going to show a bunch of pictures because I think that's the best way to describe what we did and how it's worked for us. A little context of, about who we are. Again, we're the public transportation system for our county, the county that surrounds uh, Cleveland, Ohio, the biggest city. About 1.5 million people in that county. We serve about, about 200,000 customers a day on our system. Uh, about 1.6 million departures on an annual basis. So if we were an airport, it would be a, a pretty good sized airport. Uh, we have about $350 million annual operating budget, about 2,400 employees throughout our, our system. A uh, pretty comprehensive map. Uh, again, we don't serve north because there's a, there's a big lake there, it looks like the ocean. <laughs> we kind of serve east, west, and, and, and south of that. As you can see, like most cities, a lot of our service radiates into the city, the central business district. Uh, pretty comprehensive. We have about uh, 500 buses that serve our constituents, a host of different sized buses, and many of which uh, I saw here in, uh, in, in downtown Richmond, a really great uh, way to serve our customers. Uh, we're blessed by Cleveland being a major city, not just today, but, uh, but in the past. Uh, our, our, our light rail line, uh, which was called the Shaker Rapids, celebrated its 100th anniversary last December. Uh, that's the Ooh. green line and the blue line you see off on your, off on your right. Uh, the red line, our heavy rail system, was built in the 1950s. Uh, actually, the first UMTA grant a few of you remember the term UMTA was, was issued to Cleveland urban RTA, actually Cleveland um, RTA's predecessor, to extend transfer. the red line to the airport, the first uh, transit system in North America to be, to be downtown connected to the airport back in the 1960s. So a, we have a real strong background, great infrastructure uh, throughout the network. Um, heavy rail system, obviously, the more metro type, if you're up in Washington type system, the light rail system, uh, again, uh, Shaker Rapid and extensions beyond that to the waterfront line. Uh, here, really, to talk about the health line. The health line, uh, used to, it was going to be called the silver line. You know, we have a red line, blue line, green line. It was going to be called the silver line. I'll talk about the name change in a minute, but the health line really was, was, is located on Cleveland's main street. It's called Euclid Avenue. A very significant street, you know, the power, the, the, the cent, cent, central area of power in our area dominated by streetcars back in the 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s. The streetcars disappeared, replaced by the number six bus line. It was a great bus line, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Peak hour serves about seven or eight minutes, so it was really very comprehensive. But it really was the start of, not relating to the number six bus line, but starting to the demise of Euclid Avenue. A disinvestment occurred. Uh, choice riders were not using the bus as they did the streetcar route. A lot of things happened. It was pretty obvious early on that Cleveland needed something better. Actually, the, the voters voted in the late 50s to build a subway under Euclid Avenue to kind of make, connect the two biggest employment centers. It was one, going to be a $1 billion project. Back in the 50s, like that was real money. It was going to be a county project. The county engineer, believe it or not, was not a public transit fan. And the project never happened. So you know, for years and years, people said, what are we going to do with Euclid Avenue to really bring back the glory to provide some connectivity, provide a more first class level of transportation. Uh, we did studies, subway, like rail. Uh, the do nothing certainly was, was the kind of the mode of operation for many, many years. And, you know, I think every project, you know, needs and, and has one big champion. Our champion was former Mayor Voinovich, who was at a point in time the Governor Voinovich, who at the end of 
uh, a few years up to a few years ago was Senator Voinovich, and so he's, as Mayor of Voinovich, he saw the need for better connectivity on Euclid Avenue. As Governor Voinovich, he went on a trade mission to Curitiba, Brazil, and saw the BRT system there, which was known as really the best BRT system in the world. Called back to Cleveland, said, "Come on down, or this might be the solution for Euclid Avenue." The Chamber of Commerce types went down there because they were the biggest supporters of the system. It wasn't the rise of the number six bus line. It was the developers, it was the business people on Euclid Avenue who saw year after year the value of their investment decreasing. They wanted something to turn that around. And, you know, that really, people in the U.S. back in the late 90s, early 2000s, really didn't know what bus rapid transit was. So the concept from there back to Cleveland saying this might be the solution for us. And, and we were able to go through the process, get a, a, a New Starts grant, and this was the first federal New Starts grant for a non-rail project. But we built it like rail. You know, in many ways, the only difference between rail and what we built is rails on steel wheels. We built the BRT system on rubber tires. So a lot of the same thought process in terms of how it built, how it's built, and how it how it operates. Um, our goal in, in putting, figuring out what work on Euclid Avenue is we knew we wanted to serve about 30,000 people a day. We figured we could do that with BRT as well as with rail. Wanted that connectivity, wanted something that we could provide FTA funding, like you just received with a Tiger grant. But not just funding to build it, but funding to operate it. So really, we were very concerned about the cost, not just to build, but to operate. And we did our analysis. When I go to cities and talk about this, usually what I'm hearing is, you know, you should do rail, not BRT. And, and we had those discussions in Cleveland because we were a rail city. But because we were a rail city, we also knew the costs associated with building and operating rail, and we knew we could not afford those costs on this project. So again, how do you take that rail concept, that rail first class service, and relate it to a, a, a similar mode of transportation? And I think that's certainly what we did do. Um, we wanted that rail-like image, that first class image, and not knowing, as you, you're a little farther along now, we're saying this service is going to be Fast, simple, safe, and first class. These were really, really the, four, the four mantras we had for the system. Fast, simple, safe, and first class. The riders of the, of the number six bus line, probably 98% were transit dependent riders. Again, they weren't pushing this. But we thought if we could give them something first class, and in many times, this might be the first first class thing they've ever had, we knew the rest would happen and happen for the right reason. Um, we, we, we took a, a 9.4 mile, a lot of similarities to what you're doing, 9.4 mile quarter. We replaced 108 bus stops with 36 stations. Uh, it was much more than a public transit project. We rebuilt roads, sidewalks, curbs, planted 1,500 trees, did irrigation. Uh, it really was a, a, a building face to building face project. And the level of detail was right down to replacing 108 trash cans along the quarter. We really wanted to make it a whole, you know, pedestrian friendly, bicycle friendly, public transit friendly corridor. And we did not eliminate any legal parking spots that were there initially. Really took, um, the visuals, this is what you could have initially. Again, we had no pictures, we had no examples, we had no one to come and talk to us about bus rapid transit. This is one of the pictures I used through the process. We talked about transforming this picture into this. Okay, that's the concept. You take this picture. Whoa, oh, can't go, I can't go back, I'm sorry. Uh, forget going back. <laughs> but, but, but new curbs, new sidewalks, new road, exclusive lanes, new landscape medium, new trees. And you can see, thank you, up, whoever's up in the control room. Uh, you can see the transformation. These are some of the pictures, the visuals we used to try to explain to people what we were doing. We were very lucky, as you were last week, we got a full funding grant agreement. Uh, this is Secretary Mineta coming to Cleveland. Um, we pulled every trick in the book. Before this process, I was six foot six and had a full head of hair. It was an amazing process. Did everything right. Uh, it was very, very frustrating. And then we said, hey, there's a presidential election coming up in Cleveland as a key, you know, Ohio's a key state. So this was one week before the 2004 presidential election. When Norman Etta comes representing George Bush and gives us the full funding, we had agreement. It was perfect, all because of the great application we put together, I'm sure. <laughs> um, from a funding perspective, um, I talked about the FFGA for a minute. I remember getting a call, a call from then FDA Administrator Jenna Doran saying, Joe, I've got good news and bad news. We're going to authorize you to go into final design. I said, Jenna, that's great. She said, but instead of an 80-20 project, it's going to be a 50-50 project. And, and you've got a week to let me know if you're going to raise the rest of the money. Okay. 
Um, and we did. We, we did. Basically, you know, we were able to, to move some things around. Again, there's, that one slide is the 80-20 hopeful. The other slide is the 50-50. But funding was provided by, by us in, in the small magnitude. The, uh, the state provided some funding. Uh, again, Governor Voinovich was the governor. Uh, the city, the MPO, really came in and filled in the gap between what we needed because of the change in the, in, in the percentages, and we, we, made it all, we made it all work. Uh, again, some visuals. Uh, one reason people come to Cleveland are, are interested in our system is there are really three separate systems on, on one corridor. In the downtown portion of, the Cle of, of uh, Cleveland, this is the concept. The stations are in the middle. Uh, like a rail system, the, the vehicles pull up to the station on both sides. The station serves both inbound and outbound customers. The vehicles have five doors, three doors on the right, two doors on the left. Most buses don't have doors on the left, but rail cars do. So, so we can do that. So again, we can fit that in, a real rail-like feel uh, to the corridor. Kind of a looking look from the side. Uh, again, you can see some pocket parking. Uh, all new sidewalks, brick pavers, and you can see some of the amenities we added uh, to this. In the midtown corridor of the project, um, we did things a little differently. Again, median stations still in the middle of the road, exclusive lanes. Um, but in this corridor, the buses actually pull up to the right side of the vehicle, because we use the more right side traditional port doors of the vehicle. And in this corridor, we're able to actually have other bus routes come on the corridor use the infrastructure we built, and be able to board and alight on the more traditional right side of the corridor. We also, uh, in a lot of similarities, we have two major employers on Euclid Avenue, both hospitals. We have two universities on Euclid Avenue, very important. And we're able to actually build, put some bike lanes in to connect the two. We couldn't put bike lanes in the entire length of the 9.4 miles, but most of it, and more importantly, connecting the two universities on Euclid Avenue. Again, really great support. They're very, very well, well utilized. In the far eastern end of the corridor, we lost our ability to have an exclusive lane, which was really too bad. We did it anyway, and it works anyway. So the vehicle, basically through a queue jump on the signalization system, moves to the curb lane and operates in the curb lane in mixed traffic for about a one and a half mile uh, area. That's an area where surely the vehicles are slower than where we have the exclusive lanes. But again, it, it still works. And, and because of the, the topography, uh, and, and the roadway structure, we simply could not have an exclusive lane in that area. Uh, some of the relevant characteristics, again, we want it to be quicker. I think quick is really important, as David mentioned. Uh, we have exclusive lanes. Uh, actually, our lane is 35 miles per hour, where the general auto lane is 25 miles per hour. The traffic signal prioritization system, precision docking, level boarding, off-board fare collection, all things to speed up the process. Uh, what was a 40-minute trip is, 20, is now 28 minutes, very importantly. From an operating perspective, I, went, I had 20 bus operators driving the number six bus line. Now I have better service with 16 bus operators, 16 labor units, because the service is quicker. So I've actually reduced my operating costs by providing a better system for our customers. Really good stuff. Mm -hmm. Faster buses. I'm learning for clicks. Well, well, it all depends. There we go. Well, uh, that rail-like service frequency at 24 hours a day, seven days a week, every five minutes in the peak. Off-peak is you know eight to 15 minutes. Um, we're very brand conscious, and uh, might not be as prevalent, in, and hopefully it isn't as prevalent in Richmond. But when I when I moved to Cleveland from Ohio, from from Cleveland to New York. Um, Someone wanted some, we talk about some kind of a downtown circulator type system. So, well, you know, we can have some bus routes around here. And they said, well, Joe, you're not in New York anymore. In Cleveland, suits don't ride buses. Kind of a, an interesting comment that, you know, sometimes I think a bus is a four letter word. So, we really want to provide that more rail like image I talked about. And I think that's important also in terms of how we branded the system and how, well, how we, what we call the system. I don't refer to it as bus rapid transit, as BRT is bus rapid transit. My acronym is Better Rapid Transit, taking everything we've learned from different modes and integrating it into one. Some of the ways the system is quicker, the traffic signalization system, the priority system, we have the level boarding, precision docking, uh, something we stole from SN Germany and Leeds, England. So uh, docking wheels to, to guide the vehicle in the off-board fare collection system, which really reduces that dwell time, more like that rail-type experience. Um, our fare enforcement officers, we have, we have a police force, 
Yeah, you get on and off the vehicle, ask people on a random basis, can I see your valid fare? That does a couple of things. Number one, hopefully it assures people pay, but number two, it gives our customers the sense of security to see our officers on and off the bus on a very regular basis, very positive. A lot of technology, as I'm sure you'll have in your system, real-time information uh, at all the stations, emergency call boxes, uh, cameras in the stations, cameras along the corridor, and 12 cameras on every vehicle. So we have it, if you're on Euclid Avenue, don't Somewhere outside. Um, <laughs> there are two outside, things so that, that we thought for, were very important purposes, just uh, like in terms of accidents. what is our legacy going to be, our meaning of the transit system legacy. It was going to look like a highway project or road project or sewer project, but what was going to be left to people associated with us are the stations or the shelters, we call them stations, more, more rail-like, and the vehicles. We really wanted the stations and the vehicles to be special, that, that first-class, upscale type mode. So the station design was very important to us, simple, easy to maintain, but again, something very substantial uh, for our customers. A couple different designs we worked with a local, local architect to, to come up with. The vehicle was the biggest challenge for us, and, and that might be the biggest challenge for you as well. We went through four RFP processes. Uh, this was That's not Seattle. the image we wanted to project. Uh, this was a wonderful vehicle that Seattle just bought 220 hybrid electric, 60 foot long buses that, that they were thrilled with. Um, since we had to buy America because of the federal regulations, and we went through several bidding processes, a new flyer, the maker of this, seemed like the best company to deal with, so we, we kind of made a deal with them. We said, let us help you make a better product for the marketplace, so we did that. The feds actually let us use $1.8 million in design money to help redesign the vehicle, uh, which we did with new flyer. It came out great, and so now it's stalwart of the industry. We got our design money back as, through royalties. We said the new flyer, if we're not that, the only crazy ones with this idea, that if you sell more of these, we want money back, so we get our design money back. And, and, and we did that. So again, the they, industry has a, they still a new build vehicle, 60 doors on buses, both sides, but they do not build them in that design A lot of landscaping that went along with, with this project, uh, both integrated uh, and standalone to also, really make it again that the pedestrian feel. Richmond's branding was very important. Like I talked about the branding of BRT is better rather than transit, not really, uh, you know, uh, and, and, and I, I think in the buses. local paper here I talked about, you know, BRT is the permanence of rail, but the flexibility of, of a bus system, which I think is, is very, very important. Uh, these were all like nine foot by twelve foot store window brochure things. We, you know, we we put these up everywhere we could. It's not a bus. It's not a train. It's the future. We tried to brand this as something upscale, something better, something new, uh, something innovative. Uh, we talked about business development. Uh, talked about faster commute and fewer emissions. Um, again, really trying to get the people pumped about what we were doing in their community. New jobs certainly. Um, it was more than a transit project, as I mentioned. Uh, six, you know, we, we'll talk about billions of economic development. You know, we invested a couple hundred million along with the city, which included sewer replacements and water line replacements, a complete redo. But the true value of this, the true benefit of this, was other individuals, primarily downtown property owners, business owners, leveraging our investment to make it worth billions. It was them putting their money on the table. These business owners who were downtown, who were the biggest supporters, seeing their property values decrease, their vacancy rates go up for a year, they knew they needed to do something to leverage it. It doesn't happen by itself. The city was very involved in terms of low interest loans. The city was involved in terms of transport of zoning, higher density, less parking requirements, providing incentives for people to relocate on Euclid Avenue. I wore out 14 pair of shoes walking developers up and down the avenue saying, these are where the stations are going to be. This is where you should invest. And developers doing that, being successful, and then taking that money and investing someplace else. So it really worked out worked very well for us. Uh, the chamber, the business committee, was really a big, a big spokesman for the project. Uh, when you look at who are the, the real business leaders in Cleveland, uh, the biggest employer is the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, 32,000 employees in the greater Cleveland market. Toby, Terry, uh, Toby Cosgrove, their, their CEO, uh, one of the most respected individuals uh, in the country. He was one of the spokesmen for the, spoke, those people for the project. Dr. Toby Cosgrove, heart surgeon and CEO of the Cleveland Clinic. I cannot stress enough the importance of healthy arteries. The entire system depends on them to function properly. In some cases, heart surgery reconstruction is necessary to ensure a longer, healthier future. 
I'm pleased to report that the Euclid corridor is one major artery well on its way to recovery. Restoring Euclid Avenue, the historic link between downtown Cleveland and University Circle, isn't just wishful thinking. It's happening now. Soon everyone can look forward to riding state-of-the-art bus rapid transits along a landscaped, tree-lined, and redeveloped Euclid Avenue. And just as important, it will provide over 4,000 jobs along the way. It's great for the heart of the city. The $200 million Euclid Corridor project is just part of the $2.3 billion in projects starting soon throughout our city. And another reason we can all believe in Cleveland. Um, the question wasn't for, for us and I think the developers, you know, could we move people quicker and, and faster and more satisfied? The answer was yes. The question really was would economic development follow? I think in the industry, people referred to transitory development TOD associated with rail projects, but this was, a, was not a rail project. Would people actually make that investment? That really was, was the big key. And I think the answer certainly has, has been made and the answer is yes. Our recent study done last year, looked at our project as the best return on investment of any public transit project anywhere in the country, regardless of steel wheels or rubber tires. $114 invested for every dollar of the project investment. So very, very positive. Uh, the only higher gross investment was in Denver with, with their rail system, but that was on a $1.2 billion system, not a $200 million system. So again, for ROI, our, our, our system to do that, very important to us, very important to the community. Um, we would keep track of economic development because that was really part of the process. One of the reasons our project scored pretty well with the FDA was the economic development potential. Um, I'm sure it's not like this. I mean, your reporters here are great. I've read a great, few great articles about me in the paper, so I know they're, they're right on. <laughs> but it, it wasn't always like that. In Cleveland, I had one of the reporters, one of the senior people come to see me. He says, Joe, I've heard you give these speeches about $2.5 in economic development. Where are those numbers? We're doing our own study. I said, well, Steve, here, here's our numbers. This is what we're looking at. These are the projects we're using. He says, well, we're doing our own study. We'll let you know what, what, what the results were. This was the Sunday paper three weeks after. Sometimes they have problems with reporters, not many. Sometimes with headline writers, not many times. But this was a great headline writer called The Rebirth. I couldn't have written a better headline. And Steve says, Joe, you were wrong. It's not $2.5 billion. It was $4.3 billion. And this is before we opened. So it was really great stuff. I think we really proved that. We feel very good about that. Um, you kind of heard a snippet of, of Tracy Nichols. Tracy is the economic development. Uh, director for the, for the city, one of the people like myself that promotes, if you're re relocating in Cleveland, relocate to Euclid Avenue because of the, the BRT, because of the health line. Well, when developers come with us and they're riding on that health line, the first thing they say is, Wow, right on that health line, they see all the things that we have going as far as development's concerned, and people are just flabbergasted. We have so many people wanting to come here and ask, how are we doing it? And I will tell you, the diamond in the tiara is the health line and all of the development along the health line. We, we really were most interested in, in the developers moving in to make investments. Um, to bring in jobs, to bring in people, but also to have the people that were brought in, people that used the health line. I think that was very important. Uh, Dick Pace, a, a great developer in Cleveland, um, uh, very successful. Again, I walked Dick and said, Dick, a station is going here. He bought that building, renovated it. He's now bought three other buildings up and down the avenue. Uh, again, he invested because of the project, and the people who are occupying these buildings are using the system. Two very different, but I think very important facts. Without the health line, we never would have uh, made the investment into this area. Once the health line was under construction, we were completely committed that we knew that this was going to be a good investment, and it's been great. Uh, it's been great for a couple reasons. One is that the uh, tenants use the health line. Uh, the second part is the reinvestment, that, that leap, of, leap of faith by the city and RTA to invest in Euclid Avenue. Uh, it's made a huge difference. Um, 
just some of the new buildings. Uh, again, we, we connected downtown with the University Circle, the two biggest employment areas. Those two areas are going really well. The mid, we call the Midtown Cleveland area, the, the middle of that, that barbell. Uh, the only economic activity going on there for the last 20 years was land maintenance. You know, people were tearing down old factories, tearing down old buildings. And now that is the area where the land value has doubled and tripled, where people are building new buildings, leasing them out, and then building other buildings. Very, very positive way. Things like gentrification. Um, not everyone was supporters at the beginning. Um, Ari Marin, a, a good friend of mine, um, major development, was planning a major development downtown as we were planning this project. He thought the only way his pro retail project, retail downtown, kind of, kind of shaky, the only way this would work is with more and more parking. He was very concerned about our project, very concerned we might eliminate parking. I said, we're not going to eliminate any legal parking. He said, and, and, he, and, and really said, well, how can you build more parking? I explained to him that we were trying to get funding from the Federal Transit Administration, not the Federal Parking Administration. If there was such an agency, we'd go talk to them. And his next comment was, well, if you have to have, now I understand why you have to have buses, but do they have to stop? This was really a comment. <laughs> okay, because you don't want to bring those people here because they're not going to further our development. But the thing um, is, the freshman is trying to major turnaround. Let's city, hear from, from a green city. Why are they still promoting hotel mentality? I think Cleveland is, in fact, a model for uh, other communities that are working on uh, urban development uh, in many, many ways. Uh, transit is actually a really critical part of that. Uh, we're experiencing transit-oriented development uh, in all kinds of areas of the city, downtown obviously with East 4th Street and the potential for Public Square and, and those conversions, but also in University Circle uh, with the new stations for the Red Line and leveraging the health, uh, the health line. Uh, we're seeing all kinds of transit-oriented development happening in the Circle right now. Uh, this is uh, Ari's development on East Fourth. The, the development he was talking to us about, East Fourth Street. That's Euclid Avenue at the uh, at the end of the street. Uh, great development, as you can see. The BRT system did not hurt this uh, investment in any way. Um, we talked about the other end of the line, Ari, about two years ago. Uh, based on this success, bought uh, a complete city block on the other end of the system, uh, on, the, on the University Circle portion of the system. We can get this to the um, this, is, this is that block. Uh, the two buildings you see in the far side, clad in blue, are Ari's new developments, phase one and phase two. First floor retail, upper three floors of, of scale uh, um, apartments. The other building under construction you see in the, low, in, in the lower right is a new museum of contemporary art. Uh, what is a parking lot right now, uh, we use in this picture in the lower left, that's Ari's phase three and phase four development. So very, very positive. Uh, in terms of how he made the investment, and he invested and tied that in through transit. Uh, that was about a two-year-old picture. Uh, this is the picture. Well, that was the picture today, okay? It was really great to see the development as it was complete. Um, so you've had a lot of smaller developments like that, new apartments, new senior centers, also major, major investments. The University Hospital, the second biggest employer in the region, you know, did an $800 million new cancer center on Euclid Avenue, as you could have in right in front of the building. Uh, you, you saw Tommy Cosgrove, uh, the, heart, the Cleveland Clinic, they built a, a $480 million heart center right on Euclid Avenue. There it is. Um, so, so really, really some small investments and some major, major investments to get, get to that number. Uh, I talked before about you know, calling this the Silver Line. The, the, we give it that rail-like name. As you know, now it's called the Health Line. Uh, it was called the Health Line due to a naming rights sponsorship we sold. If we can sell naming rights to stadiums, why not do it to a public transit uh, uh, asset? So it hadn't been done before as far as we knew. We hired a company that specialized in selling naming rights on stadiums. Um, I told the story before. You know, obviously, we were going after the biggest pocket, deepest pockets initially. The Cleveland Clinic and University Hospital, two biggest employers in the region. I got the phone call one morning from both Toby uh, and, and Tom Zenti, the two heads, and said, hey, I know your guys are selling us both on the same project. You're, you're, you're developing a bidding war. We're no longer going to be involved with this. If we do, we'll do this, do this together. We'll come up with a common name for it. So again, the, the system, we, we changed the name from the Silver Line to the Health Line. 
Uh, we're getting a quarter of a million dollars a year for a naming rights sponsorship, and that money is going back to help maintain the quarter in the first class mode of transportation. This week, we started little different climatic conditions in Richmond. We started pulling out these, these summer flowers and planting the mums. But again, it's really important to maintain that quarter. Every vehicle is cleaned multiple times every day. Every station is cleaned every day. And again, that's how we use the naming rights sponsorship to keep the, the project going and keep it looking great for the next, <laughs> next uh, you know, 20, 25 years. We had an on-time, on-budget ribbon cutting in 2008, a uh, very successful project. Construction, we won't talk about. I've taken all those slides out because I still have some night sweats over them. Um, it's now part of our program, part of everything we do. We, we, we promote it, people use it. We saw a 48% increase in ridership the first year. It's been going about 6% every year since then, so tremendous, tremendous acceptance by our customers, uh, great customer satisfaction in terms of travel time. Uh, uh, you can see here, on time performance travel time. 14%, um, 13% of, of the customers that take the health line tonight used to take our rail system. So it really isn't what the wheels are made of, what provides better service uh, for them. We're very pleased with that. Um, Couple of pictures. Uh, there are brochures out in front. You see some some visuals. I like the visuals of how the vehicles, the station, the landscaping all coordinated all well together. We're very proud of what we did. We're actually launching our second BRT line um, uh, this this November. We already did some naming rights sponsorship to that to a, to another major uh, downtown institution. Uh, again, that'll generate about 150 thousand a year for us for the next 30 years, inflated by three percent. So. Good money coming in. We've won, won many awards because that's why I'm here. Uh, we're very proud of what we did. We've got a great story to tell. Uh, and really, uh, the biggest satisfaction is being able to help other individuals like Richmond you know, take this vision and move on and better what we did uh, into the future. We're done. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yes. So I'm going to be moderating your questions, and what I'll ask you to do, since these stairs are a little daunting, um, is to come into the aisle, and I'll make my way up, and I'll hold the microphone for you. So, does anyone down here have a question? You know, I'll start us off while you're thinking. Um, Joe, aside from direct imperatives uh, such as uh, securing funding, regional cooperation, and perhaps presidential elections, what do you think is really the linchpin to success that we should rally behind to bring this to fruition? I, I think uh, one of the things I'm very, very impressed with here is the diversity of support. And I think that, that is critical. Uh, there are going to be bumps in the road. So I think everyone needs to stay together to push in, to push in a common direction. Um, you've come a long way. Uh, uh, it's not over. Uh, it's never over in terms of building it and operating it, which is kind of the, the fun piece to it. Uh, but I think you're certainly, you're certainly on the way to doing that. And certainly a big piece of that was getting this, uh, this funding announced last week. I have to imagine that Ms. Jerome from the Chesterfield, former Chesterfield Board of Supervisor, first female Chesterfield Board of Supervisor, would have a question. I'm concerned about air quality. It's always been a problem in the Richmond region. 95 is part of the problem. But how does this network of buses impact air quality? Well, I think one thing it does is, uh, you know, I think if you looked at that, that last slide, I talked about 14% of the individuals who take the health line today used to take a rail system. 18% of our customers on the health line used to drive signal occupancy vehicles. So it does a couple things. Number one, we have hybrid electric vehicles, um, so they are clean burning. Uh, we're averaging 72 customers per hour served on, on the BRT system. So we're pulling a lot of cars off the road, which certainly will help the air quality picture. Hi, my name is Kathleen and I'm a regular bus rider and my question is how you redesigned other routes to help serve and use the frequency of the health line to make other routes in the system better. Because 
with us not having rail, the BRT could really be the spine of our system. And so how do we make sure it makes the whole system better? Well, I think we did a couple things. Um, you know, there are great connections between our, our routes, our bus routes, and the BRT in several locations. Certainly at both ends of the line, there, there's uh, great connectivity. And there's several crosstown routes that we designed to bring people from neighborhoods into, into the BRT route. And actually, as I mentioned, the way we designed it, actually bus routes come in from the neighborhoods and are on that BRT corridor. Using the new stations, using the, some of the amenities that we, uh, we included. And that's really helping uh, ridership on all the routes. Um, again, part of our project was not just to have exclusive lanes for the BRT vehicles, but exclusive lanes uh, for other bu major bus routes as well. Again, speed is a major factor in our business. If we can get customers to their destination quicker, uh, they're happy with our service, they use it more frequently, and guess what, we even save operating dollars in, in, in doing that. So speed is the way we integrated other routes into the design, actually right onto the corridor, and looked at connectivity points where other routes cross the corridor to make really great waiting areas in those locations. And I, I'd just like to add that that is a, a component to our project, and I was speaking to a gentleman before the meeting tonight about that exact topic. Uh, we have a, a, another contract that we're awarding for technical assistance related to that exact issue. We're going to have somebody to come in and assess all of our existing routes in order to determine how to connect them to the BRT corridor. We call them feeder routes. Uh, you may have heard that term before, but that is something that we're looking to do. We want the BRT corridor to be successful. We don't want to put something in that people aren't going to use. So. Um, our whole intent is to get as many people to it in order to use it as possible. Uh, evening. Thank you for coming. Uh, I was asked to introduce myself. My name is Zeke Brody. I'm a city resident. Um, I don't take the bus to work because the 19 stops out front, but it's an hour long ride home even though I only live six miles away. So, choice rider. Um, my question is about land use. One of the things you mentioned was that the city of Cleveland supported you in some kind of rezoning and parking requirements. Um, I think that'll be important here in Richmond, and I was hoping you'd speak a little more about that. Um, the city certainly helped and supported that. A lot of it was driven by the business owners, you know, along the corridor. They, they wanted that higher density. Some of the, the photos I showed were of the higher density locations. Um, so I, th I think, you know, certainly my, my suggestion would be to work with, work with the city filers, work with the city planning and zoning departments to try to look at the density requirements, try to increase the, that density, try to, you know, looking, looking at reducing parking requirements or just looking at seeing if the parking requirements there are really realistic in, in terms of what great transit system will be out, you know, along that corridor. So it's something that I think has to happen as you start finalizing the design and start building the corridor. But, that certainly would be helpful. Uh, density and public transit go hand in hand. Good evening. My name is Stephanie Wimbush, and I noticed that in Cleveland, the transit stops are between the ongoing and coming traffic. As a person with a disability, and I'm certain this is going to be helping a lot of people who are elderly. Does it look like the ones servicing Richmond and Chesterfield and Henrico County, are they going to be in the middle of the roads or does it look like they're going to be on the, the sides? It'll be a combination. So the, the corridors I was showing earlier is broken down into four sections. Uh, part of the corridor will involve vehicles running in mixed traffic like they do today. There will be a, a long section of the corridor where they run in a median running way and a section of the corridor where they run along the curb side in other dedicated lanes along the curb. But that is going to be taken into account during the design process. So uh, as the, the stations are designed, we're going to have to factor all of the ADA components into that in order to get people safely to the stations in order to, to board and alight the vehicles. I think we, we, we also address a lot of those issues. And if someone is going, um, I may be on, on the side where that bus picks me up to go in the right direction, or I may have to cross now multiple lanes of traffic to get the other, other lane. 
We really felt that if it was in the center, people would have to walk the same distance both ways. Again, ADA, very ADA friendly. Uh, uh, countdown, visualize, you know, signals. I know you have many of those on, on Broad Street right now. So really very easy to get in onto the platform and ADA ramp up to the level boarding area. The, the, the other big advantage, um, again, this was really, what we did was the first major BRT system in the country. And not that we were smart enough, but, but one of the big byproducts is when you have exclusive lanes, no matter where they are, they're difficult to enforce, that mm -hmm. exclusivity. Um, uh, when our lanes are in the center of the road, they're much easier to enforce. The biggest violators are UPS, FedEx, and, and the U.S. Mail. <laughs> but people are much more apt to be parking in the running lane, the more curbside lane, if that's your exclusive lane, than they would be in the center lane. So really, we have less interference with, with, with delivery trucks because of where our exclusive lanes are. Uh, my name is Charles Robideau, and my question is, um, Willow Lawn is the end of the line right now. How long is it going to be before the line can extend past Willow Lawn? and we can actually take a bus to short pump. <laughs> That's a fantastic question. And actually, uh, the quarter running all the way out to short pump was one of the initial alternatives that was looked at throughout that study that we did over the past five years. Um, at this point in time, it, it was just decided that it needed to stop at Willow Lawn, but Henrico County has already said that they are open to the idea of extending it out to short pump um, as development along the, the corridor progresses. So they have already reached out to us and talked to us about their willingness to address that exact issue. And that's, <clears throat> that's one of the things we can do as citizens in RVA Rapid Transit is, is trying to um, support uh, one of the things that we, people are always asking me, what can I do as a citizen to engage in this? One of the things that RV Rapid Transit is going to be pushing for here moving forward is a full-scale vision proposal for Metropolitan Richmond for public transportation. Northern Virginia has had one, Tidewater has one, has one and now it's our turn uh, to have one. So um, we're going to be with Secretary um, Aubrey Lane tomorrow. Um, Joe will be doing this presentation for the Secretary of Transportation. And that's one of the things we're going to ask for. And if you want something to do, one thing you might do is contact Secretary Lane and let him know as a citizen, one, you support uh, having a vision proposal of the whole metropolitan area. And two, if we have a public process, you'll be willing to show up. Just like you showed up tonight, show up and, and put input into that process. I think the, the key is to start with, you know, your strongest corridor, the strongest section of that corridor, have to be wildly successful, and then the people need to say, we want more, I think. This is, I'm Nancy Finch, and my question is about fair prices. What did the, the system do to the cost for the riders, or did it do anything? Uh, again, I, I think that's a, certainly a local decision. Um, one of my goals in Cleveland was to simplify the fare. So our fare is the same no matter what you're riding. The bus, the light rail, the heavy rail, or BRT, the fares are, are all consistent. So, you know, people are not paying a premium to use this service, but the same is to ride everything else. While I'm making my way over, would you please elaborate on how you helped uh, those who would not necessarily be inclined to adopt bus rapid transit to give it a try? Um, I think we did, we did a couple of things uh, initially. Um, we, we did it. We did a, the first two weeks. We did a, a free a, a free fare for the first two weeks to introduce it to to our customers, um, and really that's all it took. I think part of the, a lot of educational process, uh, it, it took a lot more educational process for maybe the, the, the auto, auto motorists on the corner than, than the public transit customers to you know what the exclusive lanes are, if there's signal prioritization on the traffic system, how that works, um, to alert the motorists, uh, you know, to be especially aware of, uh, of pedestrians crossing to get to the other, to the other bus stop. But, it was really pretty natural. We didn't have to do much arm twisting to get people to try the helpline. 
I've been in Cleveland a number of times. It's a great system. My question is, can you talk a little bit about the um, role that the colleges and universities and the arts community have had in, in the development of the line and the way it's been utilized? Because there's some very strong similarities, I think, with you. Well, in Richmond. The, there is. There's a couple things. There, there are two, uh, two major universities on Euclid Avenue, uh, Cleveland State University on Euclid and 18th Street, uh, Case Western Reserve University. Uh, roughly four miles down the street. The, the, they are big public transit users. Uh, we have UPASS programs with both those, those universities where their students pay a, a modest fee for unlimited rides throughout the semester. So again, there's a, there's a built-in customer base there. Uh, the colleges, certainly, you know, both colleges, well, I would say Case more than Cleveland State, has really pushed that, not with the students, but with parents of future students saying, when your student comes here and pays very expensive private college rates, they don't need a car. You know, they have this great access 24 hours a day in front of the campus. Um, so I think they've really utilized this as a recruitment tool as well, uh, which has been very positive. But a uh, very high ridership group from, uh, from, from the two universities. The other thing University Circle is noted for is really that's the, the cultural center with the art museum, uh, the Natural History Museum, Botanical Gardens. Uh, and, and several of uh, the, the Contemporary Art Museum you saw in, in that photo. So uh, they are really leveraging and marketing uh, use of our systems to get to those establishments. So it's really a great relationship. Uh, hello, my name is Ray. What is the cost to ride the system to the customer? Um, again, the fare is the same everywhere. The, our, our basic fare is $2.25 for bus, Braille or BRT. We sell a five dollar uh, all you can ride day pass. Hi, I'm Dawn McNamara and I have a little bit of an engineering question. Um, trying to wrap my head around the traffic lights and the speed aspect. Um, I gather you must be looking at traffic patterns and traffic lights. Could you speak a little bit to how that will work? <laughs> One of the, the uh, features of a bus rapid transit system is signal prioritization, which basically means that uh, there will be equipment on a vehicle uh, whereby as a bus is approaching an intersection, it will cause the light to stay green longer. It won't turn a red light green, but if a light is green, it will cause it to stay green longer in order for the vehicle to proceed through the intersection uh, without having to stop. My name is Marcia Dubois, and I'd like to build on a comment that someone over here made about uh, ADA and access, and also the uh, stops in the middle. Currently, on the line on Broad Street, many of the crosswalks aren't really sufficient, so obviously there's going to need to be some infrastructure development to make it really safe for people with not only who use wheelchairs, but who may walk more slowly or use a walker to be able to get to those to the middle safely. So I just don't know if that's been built into the plan. <coughs> I just wanted to mention that. And then also to ask in Cleveland, since you all were so involved in the design, which is really exciting, um, how has that worked, that level access? Has that worked really well in terms of easy access for people to get on and off, um, just as they would, say, a subway? Yeah, it, it really has. Uh, again, the, uh, um, the technology really isn't there. I mean, when, when, in the subway, when you've got tracks and steel wheels, uh, you're really coming in uh, at a fixed location, that the level boarding is, 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 is uh, crucial. Uh, we wanted to have that same experience, of, uh, number one, for the experience or the, and the brand of it, that rail-like brand, but also you know, in terms of safety and, and quickness of boarding and alighting. Uh, we really looked around the industry, uh, found very little. The only thing we found was a, a, a docking arm that's been used in Europe for a number of years, uh, in, both in Essen, Germany, and, and Leeds, uh, England. Uh, we uh, saw, the, saw the very simple system that they use, uh, got a, a docking arm out of the junk pile behind the maintenance facility in Leeds, England. 
uh, had them ship it to us. We told the FDA we're going to use this docking arm like they do in Europe, and they said, well, how do you know it will work in the U.S.? And we said, well, aren't physics kind of the same here as they are there? <laughs> and, um, and, and then you go through the safety certification and the PMO process. Uh, we had to reverse engineer it. We had to put safety, uh, uh, different, different safety uh, attributes to it. Uh, we had to work with the manufacturer of the axle and the vehicle. Um, many, many discussions about liability. If it broke, who was going to be responsible and who was going to be sued. So it wasn't easy, but we've done it. We've been doing it now. You know, it'll be, we'll be in operation uh, six years and another two months. We've had no incidents at all. Um, when I asked the, the maintenance director in Leeds, England, what the maintenance on the docking arm was, he said, once a year we replaced the wheel, it cost about $7. I said, that's kind of what we need in, in Cleveland. <laughs> uh, we looked at some, uh, we looked at, this was a, a, a my one and only scanning junket uh, early on in the design of our system. We went there to look at some, some precision docking methods. Uh, there was a, a precision docking system in, a, a mag magnetic system in London, which they turned off because it, it hit people. Uh, there was a system in, uh, in, in the Lorraine in, in France uh, where there was white dots on the road and the vehicle had a camera that followed the white dots, uh, which was about $120,000 per vehicle. And the white dots wouldn't do well under snow. So we knew that probably wasn't going to work in Cleveland. So we're really looking for something simple and cost effective. And it, it works from the standpoint of an image and it works from the standpoint of easy egress and aggress, especially for individuals in wheelchairs. We have a little, I took the slide out because I have enough slides, but we have a little bridge plate, about a 12 inch bridge plate that can, typically if a driver pulls up properly, it's about a two and a half to three inch gap. We have a bridge plate that actually can, can cover that gap if someone has small wheels on their chair and request it. Worked out real well for us. Uh, my name is Jim, and I uh, noticed in your slides in Cleveland that uh, there are new sidewalks, you know, lots of uh, landscaping. And I'm wondering if that is going to be done here in uh, Richmond. I think that'd be a great opportunity for community partners to get involved in this project. <laughs> <laughs> no, in all seriousness, we have a uh, we have a, a, a fixed amount of funding that we have secured for this project. We're going to uh, carry that as far as we absolutely can. Um, Landscaping definitely is going to be a part of that, and we're going to do as much of it as we're able to with the money that we have, uh, but we don't know the extent of it yet because we just don't know the cost implications of a lot of the features that we've been talking about tonight, particularly the platform level boarding that, that Joe was just referring to. Um, every additional feature that we put into the system is going to come with an added cost and every dollar we put into extra features is a dollar that we can't put into these other improvements like you're talking about landscaping and that those sorts of things but as joe referred to earlier uh, they couldn't have done it without the community involvement and we're certainly looking for continued community support here in richmond as well it's, it's very unusual for for uh, the state of ohio is, is not one of the best funders of public transit in the country as a matter of fact they're one of the worst funders of public transit in the country but Again, we had a very sympathetic governor who was the former mayor. Uh, they did commit money to the project. And most of the money the state provided was really the behind the curb money, the sidewalks, the landscaping, that, that type of amenities, which really I think was very important to the success of the project and very, very important to give developers and business owners confidence and an incentive to invest in their building that, that fronted that. Yeah, that really is money that came from, from somebody else in terms of the FDA or, or, or the transit system. My name is Montague McGruder. Um, the question I have is in terms of the Cleveland plan, how much of the plan actually incorporated ideas from the general um, riding public and specifically those that actually ride the bus on a day to day basis? Very little. Um, uh, you know, our customers, we have had many, many, at over 2,000 public meetings, so we heard a lot from our customers. Um, they didn't know what bus rapid transit was, we didn't know what bus rapid transit was. So. There was not a lot of input there. Um, I think the biggest level of public input was the fact that, again, one of the reasons, one of the one of the ways you get from point A to point B quicker is is reduce the number of stops. We were very very concerned about. We knew we had to reduce the number of stops, 
As I said in the video, we replaced 108 st stops with 36 stations. And where those stations were was something very important to our existing riders. So that really was a real ongoing negotiations as to we knew the major chip generators, either them, you know, farther apart, but how far apart was was too far apart. So that was, I think, one of the major emphasis. Since they already had 24 hour seven day a week service, I think that's something they wanted. To, that's something we certainly were, we're going to going to give them anyways. They wanted to be sure the fares didn't go up, and we assured them the fares would be no more on this than they were on the uh, the bus system that this was replacing. Last question. Hi, um, does the Cleveland system use any sort of uh, like yeah. NFC communication for um, for payment, either through phone or card, like fare cards or, or passes? And with the Richmond system, is that something we're looking at for that? What kind of payment? Uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> we have, we have NFC, it. it's near field communication. No, the new iPhones has it yeah, now. Uh, so. We, we, our system went in in 2008, which means it was being designed in 2003, which wasn't there. We have ticket vending machines at every station with smart card technology. And we just had a presentation the other day about the whole smartphone thing, which we'd like to integrate at some point. As far as Richmond, we are looking at better payment alternatives uh, for our system. And actually, we just issued a request for proposals today to replace all the fare boxes on our existing fleet of fixed route buses. We're going to get those in place. And uh, part of that project is making sure that whatever this technology is that we put in integrates with the BRT system that we're planning as well. Um, we are looking at the technology that you're talking about. Uh, Joe had mentioned daily passes. We're looking at that as well. Weekly passes, monthly passes, those sorts of things. Somebody asked about the fare structure earlier. Uh, our intent is to keep the fare exactly the same and have one fare regardless of whether you're riding BRT or fixed route bus. And we want to eliminate transfer fees altogether as well as part of this overall uh, fare technology improvement. That would be really, really, really good. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to Joe for being with us. Thank you. We have a few other thank yous. Thank you again to Rich Conti from the Science Museum of Virginia. And you know, uh, Rich was saying uh, before beforehand, wouldn't it be great if the Science Museum could uh, sponsor its own stop with science uh, at the stop for you to imagine uh, the science that goes behind the BRT. So, Rich, we're going to hold you to that. And, um, but the Institute of Contemporary Art, what if they took a stop and designed contemporary art around it? We're in an exciting time uh, with this Broad Street project getting going. Uh, we want to thank Dana uh, again for moderating uh, our questions, President of the Chesterfield Chamber. Thank you for being here. Uh, the Frontier Project. Uh, and also uh, Leadership Metro Richmond who helped us promote this event. Thank you to both of them. And thank you to all our volunteers who came out tonight. Uh, thank you uh, for showing up and thank you to the PSG board members of Richmond Hill, St. James Church who has a 55 person advocacy team for transit. Um, so we're gonna replicate that in some of our other faith communities as well. Um, the last thing I wanna uh, share is that out front, David Green has designed himself a BRT sticker that looks like the, uh, you know, the OBX sticker, but it says BRT. So if you sign up for GRTC updates, you can get a BRT sticker. We've designed our stickers that say, um, uh, my other car is a bus. So if you sign up for RV Rapid Transit, get your other car is a bus sticker. And so on your way out, uh, sign up so you can get updates and, and, and keep up with what's going on. I want to let you know finally that tomorrow morning we'll be meeting with Secretary Lane, with uh, leaders of the City of Richmond, Henrico Chesterfield, and, and the business community, and Hanover County as well. So um, be encouraged. Things are happening. And uh, get out there and sign up and, and be an advocate. And as Joe said, uh, ride it <laughs> when it comes. Thank you very much.